Good evening, everyone. We're so pleased to have Peter Ratcliffe join us tonight on this wonderful evening. And um, I want to thank the Eastside Freedom Library and the Roseville Library for their ongoing partnership for the series of History Revealed programs. And if you're not a member or a donor or a supporter of the Eastside Freedom Library, the Roseville Library, or the Ramsey County Historical Society, we want to urge you to take a look at our websites and um, feel free to join us. Um, all these programs are made possible by members like you. And we appreciate your support in no matter what form it takes. And there's some great benefits to joining the Ramsey County Historical Society, including our wonderful quarterly magazine, which is award-winning. And you can find out all about that on our website, which is www.rchs.com. And again, I wanna thank the Eastside Freedom Library and the Ramsey County Library Roseville for their partnership. Please check out their websites as well. We are all committed to bringing the stories and histories of everyone in our community, and we're pleased to bring you tonight's program. So we're working on more programs for the rest of 2023. And again, check out our website and that of the East Side Freedom Library for those listings. As a reminder, we'd like you to please keep your cameras and microphones turned off during the program. Uh, you can put your questions and comments in the chat and we'll read those out loud for Peter to answer. The program is being recorded and it will be up on the Ramsey County Historical Society YouTube channel and the Eastside Freedom mm -hmm. Library YouTube channels probably some early next week. Um, Again, if we don't have a large group, we did have a lot of people sign up, then we'll be able to turn on your microphones after the program and um, for some networking and chatting about the topic. So um, the Ramsey County Historical Society is a statement that acknowledges the sacred Dakota land. Minnesota Mekoche, the land where the waters are so clear, they reflect the clouds as the ancestral and contemporary homeland of the Dakota people. It is also home to the Anishinaabe and other indigenous peoples. The Ramsey County Historical Society acknowledges that its sites are located on and benefit from <clears throat> these sacred Dakota lands. RCHS is committed to preserving our past, informing our present, and inspiring our future. Part of doing so is acknowledging the painful history and current challenges facing the Dakota people, just as we celebrate the contributions of Dakota and other Indigenous peoples. You can find our full land acknowledgement statement on our website, which includes actionable ways which Ramsey County Historical Society pledges to honor the Dakota and other Indigenous peoples of Minnesota, Mekoche. And I'm going to turn it over to Peter Ratcliffe from the Eastside Freedom Library. And again, thank you, Peter, for being here tonight with this program and for all your support. Thank you, Robin. Would you leave or put the image back up, please? Sure. Um, I, I just want to start by uh, giving thanks to Mike Alowitz, uh, who was the artist who uh, designed and directed the painting of the mural in this image. Uh, it was painted in uh, the spring of 1986 uh, on the exterior wall of the Austin Labor Center. Um, Mike had come to town uh, from Connecticut where he still lives, lived then, um, and had a marvelous participatory process in which over a hundred rank and file packing house workers, their partners, their children um, participated in deciding what images and slogans uh, should be, <clears throat> excuse me, should be in this mural and participated uh, in painting it. Uh, one of the great things about the mural uh, was that, uh, again, through this particip participatory process, um, that people decided to dedicate the mural uh, to Nelson Mandela. Uh, and at that time in 1986, uh, Mandela was still imprisoned on Robben Island uh, off the coast of South Africa. Um, and uh, not long after the mural was completed, um, a shop steward uh, from the 3M plant 
in Johannesburg, South Africa, uh, Amon Masane. Uh, Amon came to receive uh, the dedication to Mandela, uh, and it included uh, giving him a Cranmere Spam t-shirt uh, for him to bring back to South Africa and smuggle uh, into Nelson Mandela's cell uh, on Robben Island. Uh, tragically, um, and we'll talk more about this uh, in the course of the story tonight, but tragically, when the International Union, the United Food and Commercial Workers, um, put the local union, local P9, in trusteeship, um, and that is they took over the local, they kicked out the elected officers, um, they signed a contract with the company giving most of the concessions uh, the company had been demanding. Um, and they then proceeded to sandblast uh, this mural. So you are looking at a picture of a mural um, that no longer exists. Uh, Mike Alowitz uh, likes to refer to himself as the world's most censored artist. Um, we don't have the quantitative data uh, to, to uphold that reputation, um, but it certainly is Mike's kind of attitude and, and demeanor. Um, but I have always, or at least since 1986, um, been deeply moved uh, by this mural. And, um, and I wanted to make sure you all knew the backstory to the mural itself um, and the name of the artist uh, who had created it. Okay. Now we can begin. We can begin the show. You can take that down if you would, Robin. Um, so um, I'm not going to do a PowerPoint. Um, I'm just going to talk, and um, and I hope that you will have comments and questions uh, as as we move along. Um, I taught uh, labor history and immigration history at McAllister College. Uh, from 1982 to 2012. Um, and in 2014, my partner Beth Cleary and I co-founded uh, the Eastside Freedom Library uh, here on the east side of St. Paul. Um, and uh, eight months ago, uh, Beth and I stepped down and uh, our board selected Sangmini Labut uh, to uh, become the first full-time uh, executive director of the Eastside Freedom Library. Um, we both, Beth and I, continue to be involved um, in various ways, of course, um, at, at the library and hope that you will come visit it, um, that you will uh, subscribe to our free uh, twice a month electronic newsletter uh, to find out what else is going on. Um, at the library. So I, um, I got involved uh, in the Hormel strike um, in the fall of 1984. Uh, a number of uh, leaders uh, from the local union uh, came to St. Paul to meet with a group of union activists and uh, to let us know uh, what was brewing in Austin. And um, not only uh, did I get involved uh, in the strike itself, uh, in organizing support for the strikers, um, but I found the story of Austin, Minnesota, the story of uh, meatpacking workers at the George A. Hormel plant uh, to be a story with multiple layers um, and that those layers both led to the next iteration of conflict and organizing uh, in the plant, um, but also um, demarcated moments of internal conflict and, and struggle. So um, when I first went to Austin, uh, in the fall of 1984, um, I discovered that there was a display 
of uh, union buttons uh, in a case on the wall. And, uh, and they looked a lot to me like uh, IWW, Industrial Workers of the World buttons. Uh, but when I looked more closely at them, I saw that what it actually said uh, was IUAW, Independent Union of All Workers. Um, and these were dues buttons, a different color uh, for every month to indicate uh, beginning in November 1933 uh, that, that workers had paid their monthly dues uh, to the union. So as I was kind of captivated by this display of buttons, um, I asked someone who was standing there next to me, um, I had looked around the Austin Labor Center and, um, and found that the, it was an entirely white uh, group of people. And I had studied meatpacking when I was in graduate school at the University of Pittsburgh and, uh, and, and had done research on uh, Chicago, Kansas City, Omaha, um, and, and had seen that virtually everywhere that there was meatpacking in the United States, there was a significant presence of African-American workers. And so I asked the fellow standing next to me, where are the black guys? Aren't there any African-American workers um, in the plant and, and in this local? And, um, and he said to me, no one black has lived in Austin, Minnesota since 1922. And um, I was floored um, and, and took that as a cue to begin to do some research. What in the world had happened in 1922 so that African-Americans avoided Austin, Minnesota? Years later, a book would be written by a wonderful social historian named Jim Lowen. Uh, Lowen was already well known for his book, uh, Lies My Teacher Told Me, and a follow-up book, Lies Across America. But Lowen wrote a book um, in the late 1990s titled Sundown Towns. And many of us had not even heard of a sundown town. And what Lowen did in his book was that he picked at least one community in every state in the United States where it had been communicated to African Americans that they were not welcome in that community after dark. Um, they might come in and work during the day, but they could not live in the community. In Minnesota, Lowen wrote about two towns, Edina and Austin. We've had some exposure to this uh, story um, through the work of Chad Montry. Um, Chad's book, Whiteness in Plain View, is very influenced by Jim Lowen's work. Uh, and Chad writes about both Edina and Austin. And we will be, we being the history revealed crew of um, Ramsey County Historical Society, Roseville Public Library and Eastside Freedom Library. We will be hosting Chad Montry in August um, who will talk more about this concept of sundown towns, um, how it played a role in Minnesota, um, how we can have this, and I think this is a, a big question for, for Chad and, and really for all of us, how could this be a significant part of our history and we didn't know about it? Is the right verb that we forgot it? Did we never know it? We're living in a moment where there is great conflict in the United States 
um, about what kids should be taught in school, um, about whether some of us wanna teach history in a way that will make particularly little white kids feel guilty. Um, we have sanitized our history. And Austin is a place where that history happened and was later sanitized, but also was later reversed in interesting ways. And I wanna kind of bracket my presentation tonight with 1922 at one end and the dedication of this mural to Nelson Mandela in 1986 on the other end. So in 1922, which is, you know, four years after the end of World War I, and that World War I had seen a great deal of labor conflict, um, the famous Seattle general strike um, several months after the end of the war and in, in early 1919, um, also saw ferocious race riots uh, in Chicago in the summer of 1919. In fact, there were 25 major race riots in the United States in the summer of 1919, leading some people at the time to call it the Red Summer. And they were not referring to the Bolsheviks. They were referring to the racial conflict, the violence that was meted out largely by white perpetrators on, on black victims. And in 1922, shortly after the war, there was a nationwide strike of railroad shop workers. So the workers who built and repaired locomotive engines, um, freight cars, um, all the running stock of, of the trains. Um, and this was an enormous strike um, over 100,000 workers uh, went on strike across the country. And the strikes had kind of epicenters, um, which were uh, what were called railroad roundhouses. So the, the, essentially the factory that the workers worked in um, was open at either end and railroad tracks literally ran through the factory so that trains could be driven in to be worked on and then driven out when, when the work was completed. And in Austin and a number of other places, the major employers, the railroads, sought to hire strike breakers to take the place of the workers who had gone on strike. And it was only with World War I that significant African-American migration from the South to the North really became an, an important part of the American labor, racial, social scene. Um, and uh, these railroad employers looked to this newly arriving African-American population um, to take the jobs of the workers who were on strike. And in Austin, as in other places, uh, they housed them in the roundhouse so that they didn't have a daily confrontation uh, with the picket lines. But led by workers from the Hormel plant, in the summer of 1922, in July, a, I feel like I have to use the noun, a mob of angry white workers forced their way into the roundhouse and 40 odd African-Americans who had been living and working there ran out the back of the building and dove into the Cedar River and attempted to swim across the Cedar River to save themselves. To this day, 
there is no accounting of how many of those workers drowned. But the punchline became, no one black has lived in Austin since 1922. Fascinatingly, and I, I, I wanna mention, there is an outstanding new book uh, that's just come out um, by a historian named Donald Yacavone, Y-A-C-A-V-O-N-E, Donald Yacavone, entitled Teaching White Supremacy. And Dr. Yacavone teaches at Harvard, um, has published a number of books, and is now beginning to be in a series of projects that again are addressing this contentious issue of what historical narratives are kids being taught in the schools. And his argument is that for hundreds of years in the United States, kids were taught white supremacy. And he says that lying beneath it is this very strange, unique intersection of white supremacy on the one hand and democracy and republicanism on the other hand. And so in the United States where you know, we, we refer to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and, and we look at the expansion of citizenship to white men over the age of 21 who did not own property uh, beginning in the 1830s and 1840s. We find that for some people in the United States, access to voting, access to political life, um, thinking of oneself as a citizen um, was restricted to a particular group of people, white men over the age of 21. And interestingly, it was not restricted by class, which was the case in the Europe that preceded the formation of the United States, where the right to be represented in parliament, the, the right to a voice, the expectation that your interests would be reflected and, and considered only went to people with property, only went to people with a certain degree of wealth. But in the United States, there was this much broader democracy, but within limits. And those limits were gendered. It was men and not women. Those interests were racialized. They were available to white people, not to black people, certainly not to indigenous people. And that many of the immigrants who would come to the United States from Italy, from Greece, from the Austro-Hungarian empire, would actually have to engage in a process that might take more than an entire generation of becoming white, of not just being Italian or Italian American, but being white. And this is something that Professor Iacovoni writes about in, in his book, Teaching White Supremacy. And this is part of the legacy of lived experience in Austin, Minnesota. Because remarkably, and, and maybe it's just my own optimism that I wanna call it, I use the adverb remarkably, that many of the same workers who led the mob in July of 1922, that attacked those African-American strike breakers 
including probably killing some of them, that those very same white packing house workers marched on the Hormel plant itself, November 10th, 1933, 11 years and a couple months later, and marched into the plant and took it over in a sit-down strike, the first sit-down strike in the history of the United States. And so before we throw those workers aside as racists, we also have to wrestle with how they took a militant position vis-a-vis -vis their employer, the Hormel Company. Now, November 1933, we're four years into the Great Depression. Um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had become president, uh, assumed the presidency in March uh, of 1933. Um, there had been a remarkable national protest called the Bonus Army, in which more than 10,000 World War I veterans marched on Washington, D.C. to demand the payment of a bonus that they had been promised when they left the military in 1918. There had been some activism, but the sit-down strike in November was, was, was really an enormous new step. And the workers, had the idea that they would occupy the plant, hold the meat hostage until Jay Hormel, the CEO of the company, obviously part of the Hormel family, until he would come into the plant and negotiate with them. First thing Jay Hormel did was he reached out to the governor of Minnesota Floyd Olson. And Olson, of course, was a farmer labor governor, had just been reelected uh, to his second term as governor. And Hormel said, you better get down here and sort this situation out because these workers have stolen my property. And as the story is told, uh, Floyd Olson indeed uh, travels to Austin uh, and um, goes on a kind of fact-finding tour, uh, driving around the plant with his chauffeur and Jay Hormel. The two of them are in the back seat. And as they're driving around the plant, uh, workers occupying the plant are taking baseball bats and breaking out the windows because they're afraid that they're going to be tear gassed. And uh, as the story is told, Mr. Hormel says to Governor Olson, um, you see why you've got to do something? They're destroying my property. And uh, Olson supposedly responded by saying, um, but Jay, I thought you always wanted an open shop. Um, part of what I love about that story is, is that if it's true, the only person who could have told that story was the chauffeur and that he was listening to this conversation between these two powerful men in, in the back seat of the car. Well, the sit-down strike lasted only three days and Jay Hormel gave in on virtually every demand the workers were making. And they were remarkable demands, given not just those times, really any time in the United States. The workers demanded and received a 52 week layoff notice. That is if you worked in the plant, you could not be laid off 
if you had not been given notice a year before you were going to be laid off. Now, meatpacking was probably the most notoriously seasonal industry in the United States. Um, there was actually, a, one of the things I love about being a labor historian is learning the vocabulary and the lexicon that workers use in, in particular industries. Um, in the meatpacking industry, there was actually something called the hog rush. And having gone to college at a time where myself and many of my peers um, were hostile to fraternities and, and saw fraternities as kind of the epitome of sexism. Um, my first thought was, what oh, was the hog rush? Is, is that a critique of fraternities? Um, like the fr fraternity rush? But no, the idea was that, that most baby hogs reached sufficient maturity to be slaughtered in the early fall. And so in the meatpacking industry, there was a great demand for labor in August, September, October, November. And then there were massive layoffs after Thanksgiving. And here were the workers saying, we don't want to work under those circumstances any longer. And the company gave in. They also said, we, we want a guaranteed annual wage. We want to know what we're going to make over that 52 week period. This is 1933. And, and these are the same workers who attacked African-American workers 11 years earlier. The Hormel workers went on to create a new union, the union whose buttons I mentioned earlier tonight, the independent union of all workers. They were kind of, or at least the leading activists were, were kind of premature environmentalists. They said, we believe that if you raise food, prepare food, eat food, you all ought to be in the same union. So this wasn't just saying what you do in an auto factory or what you do in a steel mill that the skilled workers and the unskilled workers should be together. They said all workers should be organized together. And they began to spread the independent union of all workers. One of the great scenes in Austin uh, took place in the Montgomery Ward's department store where the clerks had joined the union, but management at Montgomery Ward's refused to recognize it. And so a bunch of meatpacking workers went to Montgomery Wards, filled up shopping carts with whatever, queued up at the cash register and said to the clerk, well, sister, where's your union button? And the clerk would respond and, and say, well, management won't let me wear my union button. And the whole line of meatpacking workers with overflowing carts would say, well, none of us are gonna check out of this store until management lets you wear your union buttons. And lo and behold, Montgomery Wards got unionized. In Albert Lee, women working in the Woolworths had a sit down strike during which they entertained themselves by listening to reports of Amelia Earhart flying across the world. This was in 1937. The same union, the Independent Union of All Workers. And they really began to establish values and ideas about unionism that we would see reemerge 
1934, a year later, in the series of strikes that Minneapolis Teamsters organized and the ways that those Teamsters organized by saying truck drivers, helpers, warehouse workers, all ought to be in the same union. They shouldn't be broken up into a bunch of different unions. And these ideas and values were then carried in 1935 into the birth of the CIO, organized by nine unions that stood up at the AFL convention in Atlantic City and said, we want a different structure of unions. We don't want unions to be just the highly skilled workers off looking after themselves. We want unions that everybody can be part of. And when the president of the AFL, who was the president of the Carpenters Union, when, when he refused that motion, John L. Lewis, who was the president of the United Mine Workers Union, turned on his heels and marched out of the room, followed by the presidents of eight other unions who went off and had a separate convention creating the CIO, the Committee for Industrial Organization. A year later in 1936, meatpacking workers would create an organization called the Packing House Workers Organizing Committee. Many of these workers from Austin played a leading role in creating the CIO and in creating the Packing House Workers Organizing Committee, which would become the United Packing House Workers of America, um, again, only another year or two later. So I don't have a, an easy explanation for how people carry in their heads and in their hearts, both the kind of racialized anger that was expressed in 1922 and the kind of vision of solidarity and organizing together um, that would happen in 1933 and, and in the years uh, thereafter. Now, and we could spend a lot of time trying to make sense out of, I feel like there's, there's kind of a, we reach a, a level of maturity as historians, when we realize that the people that we're studying were full of contradictions. And, and maybe in those moments, we also wonder about the contradictions that we ourselves might be full of. Um, but um, let's leave that aside for a moment and, and look a little more at the, the impact because the impact includes the passage of the National Labor Relations Act in 1935, the creation of a, not only a system of labor relations in the United States in which the government plays a major role in sanctioning a union organization and establishing rules that employers are supposed to follow. Um, but we also see the creation of a new macroeconomic system called Keynesianism and, and the idea of demand driven economics. So that the way to get the economy out of the Great Depression was to enable workers to earn high enough wages that they could become consumers and not only the makers of cars, but the buyers of cars, not only the builders of houses, but the owners of houses and, and so on. And those ideas of Keynesian economics would really be blown up and, and solidified by World War II and the need for the government to encourage manufacturers to produce airplanes, submarines, missiles, uh, rifles, tanks, uh, whatever was gonna be needed to fight uh, World War II. 
And that political economic system of Keynesianism and a kind of tolerance of unions with, within certain boundaries, but tolerance of unions would dominate American industry from 1940 to the mid 1970s, perhaps even to the election of Ronald Reagan uh, in, in November of 1980. Um, and of course, Reagan's firing of the air traffic controllers in the summer of 1981 uh, really signified the, the end of that Keynesian social contract tolerance system and its replacement by something that initially people called supply side economics, um, more competitive economics, um, and now the kind of confusing term neoliberalism um, has been applied to, to describe this system that not overnight, but over the course of the 80s would replace um, Keynesianism. So let's look at Austin and Hormel in that context. In 1977, the management of the Hormel company announces, and, 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 and I can't help, I just need to say, what we have experienced in Minnesota in the last week on the part of the Mayo system, on the part of Uber, we have seen as the legislature was coming to the close of its session, suddenly several major corporate employers in Minnesota announced that they were going to pull out of the state or refuse to make additional investments if certain laws were either passed or not passed. It reminded me immediately of this story I'm about to tell you, that in 1978, the management of the Hormel Company announced that the plant in Austin was hopelessly decrepit and that it, the time had come for the company to build a new plant. And then they said, convince us why we should build the new plant in Austin. We could build it anywhere. In that moment, Hormel had plants in Fremont, Nebraska, Ottumwa, Iowa, Atlanta, Georgia, Dallas, Texas. They had eight other plants around the United States. And they said, why, why, should, we, why should we build it here? And uh, when people said, well, <laughs> you made your bones here, you made your profits here. This is, this is the home base of this country. How dare you? threatened to move. And the company said, no, oh, we're not going to be compelled by, by that kind of discourse. We, we need to have some real material incentives. And so the city of Austin announced that if the company built a new plant in Austin, they would be exempt from property taxes for 10 years. The state of Minnesota announced that if Hormel built a new plant in Austin, that they would expand Interstate 90 and build new entrance and exit ramps leading from the plant to the highway so that both animals to be slaughtered and finished product uh, could be carried away more easily. And then the company came to the union and the union said, 
we'll take a wage freeze until the new plant is built and up and running. And the management said, okay, on those grounds, we'll go ahead and build the new plant here in Austin. The new plant opened in 1982. And from the worker's perspective, it was a nightmare. The lines ran much faster. Workers talked a lot about the way knives get sharpened and that in the old system, the workers sharpened the knives with stones. That was part of their skill. The new system had automatic mechanical sharpeners that did not work as well. And there was an epidemic of carpal tunnel in the plant. There were back injuries in the plant. There were even incidents where workers accidentally stabbed each other with knives because they were working so fast and they were standing so close together. So the, the work was horrific. When the company sat down to bargain, the contract that would be voted on in 1984 and that would be operative in the new plant, the workers thought, and, and I want you to put yourselves in the shoes of the workers, if you had had a six or seven year wage freeze, and now the company had a brand new, and in their own language, state of the art plant. Would you not assume that the next contract would give you a raise after having had a wage freeze for so long? Lo and behold, the company came to the bargaining table and said, we want you to take a 23% wage cut. And, and the workers were shocked. After seven years of a wage freeze, now a wage cut in a plant in which people are being injured left and right. And so there was a hell of a conflict in the union and a younger generation, a group that even referred to themselves as kind of the Vietnam War era generation, contested for the leadership of the local, defeated the old guard who had accepted that wage freeze, who had worked together with the company on the building of the new plant. And they and, and this new young angry, aggressive, and intelligent leadership said, we're gonna find a way to get the company to, to back off on what they're demanding. And they were aware that there was a, a guy named Ray Rogers based in New York City, who had worked for a number of unions as a strategist. And they reached out to Ray and they said, can you help us develop a strategy that will enable us um, to get the company to back down? And Ray's approach was what he called a corporate campaign. And that is he did a lot of financial analysis of what other companies were invested in this particular company, what roles they played on the board of directors, how they might be vulnerable through their own financial interests. And he identified First Bank, which is today US Bank, as, as a major player in decision-making at Hormel. And so he began to encourage the union to put heat on the bank, to pick at the bank, um, to talk about uh, to people who might have bank accounts there, um, why they should take their money out and, and put it somewhere else. Um, he also, Ray also brought a vision of involving whole families 
knowing that strikes are terrible pressure on families, how to involve spouses and children in the activism of the union, and how to seek solidarity at the other Hormel plants, um, solidarity from other unions, which is how I got drawn into the, into the struggle when they came to St. Paul for a meeting at the auto workers union hall and, and one of the auto workers and the electricians and the public employees and uh, other local unions uh, to commit resources and support. One of the ideas that Ray brought to the struggle was, was what he called the adopt a family program. And, and that is they asked local unions around the United States if they would commit to adopt one striking family. And by adopt, they meant commit to making their bills, to paying their mortgage or their rent, to paying their kids' tuition if they were in college, to paying for groceries and utilities. There were 1,750 strikers. Every single striker's family was adopted by some union in the United States. Unions in 19 other countries. This is how like the story reaches the workers in South Africa, that they would be interested and try to show their support, not just because there would be a mural dedicated uh, to Nelson Mandela. And this solidarity really became the lifeblood of this struggle. The strike began in August of 85. And in January of 86, Hormel announced they were going to reopen the plant and that they would hire replacement workers to replace the workers who were on strike. And that due to a recent Supreme Court decision that they could make these, per these replacement workers permanent. And so workers who were on strike would lose their jobs. It was a pretty shocking development. It was even more shocking when Governor Rudy Perpich called out the National Guard and sent the National Guard to Austin to break through the picket lines and to enable the strike breakers to go in and go to work. If you think back to 1985, 86, this is in the midst of the period of the so-called farm crisis in Minnesota. This is when that organization Groundswell emerged among farm families that farmers were in tough conditions. And so in some cases, an older child, in some cases, a spouse would leave the farm to go seek a job crossing the picket line in order to earn enough income to help the family pay their taxes, pay their mortgage, keep the farm. So it was a terrible stage. Uh, in, in the conflict. At that point, the International Union, the United Food and Commercial Workers, announced that there was no way that the union local P9 could win this strike. And so they ordered the local leadership, that Vietnam era leadership, to run up the white flag and, and give up. And when they refused, the International Union placed the local in trusteeship, as it's called in the world of labor, and appointed individuals, some of whom had been part of the leadership of the local before, when the agreement was made to take the wage freeze. And they became the officers of the union. They settled the contract. 
it wasn't as deep as a 23% wage cut. It ended up being more like a 15% wage cut. Um, many workers retired rather than come back. Others um, were, were fired from the so-called recall list for so-called misbehavior, including things like having a Cramier spam bumper sticker on your car. That got you fired um, from the plant. Um, workers were fired in Fremont and Ottumwa when they refused to go back to work um, in support of the workers in Austin. This became a, on the one hand, again, when we think about contradictions, on the one hand, this remarkable expression of solidarity and involvement on the part of workers and their families and workers who supported those workers, a really remarkable expression of solidarity. And on the other hand, a crushing defeat. And it, it, it's sort of a, an irony, if that's the right word, certainly a manifestation of this thing called neoliberalism, that when the strike ended in the late spring of, of 86, when the strike ended, the plant manager announced that he was becoming an entrepreneur and that he was starting his own meatpacking company called Quality Pork Products. And that his first venture was inside the Hormel plant. Again, this is a plant that gets built between 78 and 82. When it's open, it's ballyhooed as the state-of-the-art meatpacking plant in the, in the country. And now, four years later, the company builds a wall in the middle of the plant and says on this side of the wall, this is quality pork products. And quality pork products does what they call in the meatpacking business, the kill and the cut. So they kill the animals and carve up their carcasses. And on the other side of the wall is hormal meatpacking, where bacon, sausage, spam, where finished products are, are going to be made. Furthermore, the union being run by the trustees, the union agrees to a new contract with quality pork products that pays those workers $2 an hour less than the workers on the other side of the wall in the same building. Needless to say, the kill and the cut jobs are the hardest jobs, the dirtiest and most dangerous jobs. And they're gonna pay less for those jobs. Over the next couple of years, many of those farmers and, and farm kids who had crossed the picket line to go to work at Hormel's in the winter of 1986, and now found themselves being paid even less, working jobs that were brutal and demanding, they begin to quit. And Hormel begins to recruit workers from Mexico, uh, Guatemala, Bosnia, Herzegovina, um, and, the, and, and who's doing those jobs becomes a very different group of, of people. Um, Okay, I want to end, and I, and I hope that I'm more raising questions for you than, than giving you just a straight narrative. Um, recently, 
United Food and Commercial Workers Local 663, based in Minneapolis, merged with the local union in Austin. UFCW Local 663 is in a very exciting period of transition. Last year, they elected a Chinese American woman as president of the union. And she then invited an African American named Mike Potter, who had been president of a small UFCW local in Worthington, Minnesota, where largely Latino immigrants had organized in 2005, six, seven, um, and Mike Potter as an African-American played an outstanding role representing those immigrant workers. And now he is the co-leader of UFCW Local 663. So we have an Asian American woman and an African American man now directing this union, which only maybe six months ago um, merged with the local union in Austin. I have no idea what's being planned, but I think it's an exciting new chapter in labor history and the history of race and racism in the United States, a new chapter that's being written. Um, and, and here we are 101 years after um, that railroad shopman strike and that horrible murderous behavior in Austin um, that led to the death of, of some African-Americans. So um, I'm hopeful, optimistic, excited by the new developments, curious about what's going to happen. Um, I think that all this history that I've been talking about tonight, 1922, 1933, 1985, 86, um, that that, whether people know it or not, that that history is carried forward with people. And as a teacher and as a historian, I have to believe that it's better if people know that history so that they're able to look at it, talk about it, come to grips with it, figure out what parts of it they want to build on and, and what parts of it they want to make reparations and, and, and amends for what might have done been done by their grandparents or in their names. Um, this is a moment, and, and I, I just find it so interesting that a moment when teachers in Florida, in Texas, in other parts of the country are being told um, that there are books that they can't have in their classrooms, that there are movies that they can't show to their students, um, that we're at a moment where all of that messy history, some of it horrifying, some of it inspiring, that has gone on in Austin, Minnesota, that that history is going to play a role in the next steps uh, of what's going to happen there. So I'm I'm going to stop and and see Robin if we got some questions, comments. Yeah, if you can put your questions and comments in the chat, um, I'll read those out for Peter. And um, thank you for a really fascinating summary of a very complicated story. Um, this was really interesting. I certainly didn't know all the ins and outs of it. And I really appreciate your, your, your insights and history here. So um, while we're waiting for the questions, can you just touch a little bit about um, the response? If you if if you know what the town of Austin, how did how did the people who didn't work at the plant um, feel? I mean, we can make assumptions. Yeah. But yeah, I think that um, the, there, there were handmade lawn signs 
that we saw that that said Jay Hormel cared. Um, so th there were some people who thought that the family itself had been paternalistic. Uh, the family that had agreed to that contract in 1933 that gave a guaranteed annual wage and a 52 week layoff notice, um, that if that family were still running the company, um, what was being done uh, would not be happening. Um, there were, uh, so there, there is a movie, I should mention it, uh, called American Dream that won the Academy Award in 91 or 92. Uh, made by Barbara Koppel. Um, I really don't like the movie, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but she does show in the movie um, that there was conflict even between brothers, um, one on one side, one on the other. Um, the, town, the town was really sharply divided. Um, the town has changed largely because of the influx of immigrants taking the jobs that, frankly, that white people didn't want to do. Um, and a year ago, I think, um, the very first immigrant was elected to the Austin City Council, um, someone from, a, from Ethiopia. Um, there is, a, not surprisingly, um, a kind of vibrant um, small business restaurant sector um, being run by immigrants um, because people want to eat the comfort foods that, that they had had as, as children. Um, I think Austin has changed a, a good deal. Um, I think it's going to take another serious conflict for us to find out to what degree has power really shifted. So relationships among the workers have changed. The ways that workers think of themselves racially, nationally, that has changed. Um, whether that's going to make a difference in the power of the workers vis-a-vis -vis the company, um, that remains to be seen. Looks uh, like we're getting some questions, Robbie. We've got some questions and I'll, I'll go back and read some of the um, earlier ones, but before I get to the question, which is a sort of backpacking of the one I just asked, um, Tess put in in the chat, please take a look at that about Farrah Stockman's book, American Made, What Happens to People When Work Disappears, about an Indianapolis factory, um, and the contrast between the experiences of black and white workers. And she put a link in the chat. So thank you, Tess, for putting that in. We appreciate that. That's a very good book. Thank you very much, Tess, for mentioning it. Yeah, yep. we appreciate that. Um, Edward had a question sort of leading off of the one I asked. He ha wanted to ask about life in Austin between 1922 and 1978 when the company was more reasonable with the union workers, if it was, you know, had a different effect on the development of the town, maybe? Yeah, I think that there, there was great uh, pride um, and, and in a way, you know, it, it's contradictory. There was pride in being a Hormel worker and there was pride in being um, a member of the union, um, by then the United Packing House Workers of America. Um, and some of the people who had been very active in the union in Austin became officials in the union and participated actively in the organization of African-American workers um, in Cedar Rapids, in South St. Paul, in uh, Omaha. Uh, there were organizers from Austin uh, who played very positive roles. Um, but I, I, I think that there was this pride um, that, that people had. And, 
and the pride that they worked very hard, um, but they had something to show for it, that the rate of home ownership uh, was high. Um, I sort of got mixed stories from people when I asked, um, you know, did, did the packing house workers want their children to become packing house workers or did they want their children to go away to college um, and, and get a cleaner, better job? Um, and, and I think there was kind of some mix there where certainly um, the sense of pride and the ability to make a good living um, led the ensuing next and next generations to stay in the plant um, and to, to remain meatpacking workers. Um, and then there were some, of course, who, who would go away to college and, and move away. Um, but I think Austin is now, is very different because of the diversity that's there. Um, how about another question, Rob? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, there was a question about um, the current um, labor force, if it's unionized, or the, what's the current current state of affairs right now? Yeah, they, they are unionized. Um, uh, they are in now United Food and Commercial Workers Local 663. Um, and the way private sector union organizing works in the United States is if, if there is a union contract and um, then everybody, uh, there are dues taken out of everybody's paychecks and, um, and, and everybody is considered a member of the union. Um, I don't know, um, you know, what kind of turnout is there at union meetings? Uh, do people feel a strong sense of connection? Uh, to the union. Um, I, I don't know what's happening on the ground in, in Austin um, with this sort of remade workforce. Okay. But I'm, I am confident that the leadership, the Minneapolis-based leadership of UFCW Local 663 is going to make a hell of an effort um, to build that kind of connection and, and organization. Um, there are times when I feel like using the expression organized labor is kind of a bad joke. Um, is, is they're not very organized. And, and I think simply having people have a union card in their pocket um, doesn't mean that they're actually organized. And I think that the human resources are now there in Austin to reach back into the history that I've been talking about and draw out the important experiences and, and to essentially rebuild a union in, in the plant. Oh, um, we had a question about Paul Wellstone, if he got his political start at the Hormel. Strike. No, I mean, Paul was already um, active. Um, he played a very important role because of his relationship with the farmers movement, with Groundswell. And there were several occasions where um, Paul helped organize farmers' protests in support of the meatpacking workers. There was an amazing uh, tractor cade that circled the Minnesota State Capitol in which farmers came into St. Paul to protest Governor Perpich's use of the National Guard uh, to break the strike. So um, Paul had already been pretty active um, prior to, I'm not sure, he might already have been elected state auditor um, by, by 84, um, but he was definitely in the mix uh, from the very beginning of the struggle. Um, well, let's see. Uh, there's a couple more questions here. Thank you, everybody, for your great questions. We appreciate it. 
Um, Jamie had a question about Ray Rogers. Um, where is he now? And did the UFVW withdrawal have consequences? So um, Ray, I believe, is retired. Um, his organization, Corporate Campaign Incorporated, uh, was based in New York. Um, several people who worked with Ray um, are still active. Um, there's a really good kind of research organization called Good Jobs First uh, that several people who were mentored by Ray uh, have gone on to establish. Hardy Green, who worked with Ray, wrote a very good book uh, on strike at Hormel. Um, but I'm pretty sure that, that Ray is uh, retired. Um, and then what, what was the other part of Jamie's question? The other part of Jamie's question was, um, did the UFVW um, withdrawal have consequences? Well, I mean, they, they, they never withdrew. Um, the problem was that they held their hand on the rudder and turned the ship in the direction of going backwards rather than forwards. So it never became a non-union plant. Um, you unfortunately um, had a union that for a period of time um, was willing uh, to negotiate wage cuts uh, and, and to go backwards. And, um, and I think that, you know, when, when, we, when we saw the first couple years of the pandemic and heard a little bit, nowhere near enough, but a little bit, our friend Fred DeSam Lazaro had a good piece on the PBS NewsHour. Uh, Joey Peters, who writes for the Sahan Journal, had a couple of good pieces. Um, you know, when, when, when we heard about how many packing house workers were getting COVID and how inadequate the protections, the safety protocols were in the meat packing plants. Um, and then we had to face the fact that these were unionized plants um, where the working conditions were still in 2019 in 2020, in 2021, um, that meatpacking workers who might have been being hailed as essential, um, that they were getting sick and some of them were dying. And, um, and the companies wanted to say, well, that's because they, they all want to live together, you know, a dozen people to a house or an apartment. And of course, they were doing that because the wages were so damn low. Um, but the fact that those were unionized plants suggests that there's still a lot of work to be done in that union and in this industry, a lot of work to be done. So um, we're getting close to time, and I yeah. want to get to a couple more of these questions. Um, Edward had a question about the stories about children working, cleaning, killing floors at night. And then Michelle had a question about how um, your and other historians' views on the strike changed out of time. And then I'll end up with the um, comment question from Toro. Great, great. So, um, and now I'm gonna forget them because they were more than one. Yes. Okay. So Edward so, wanted to ask about the stories. Oh, about, about the, the children. children. Yeah. Yes. So, um, you know, the Iowa legislature um, passed a bill in the last month um, saying that children 15 and 16 uh, should be able to work in meatpacking plants and, um, and on construction sites. Um, there are certainly bills that have been introduced um, in the United States legislature and Congress. Um, I mean, the, I'm an optimist, um, but I also believe that it's possible for us collectively to go backwards rather than forwards. And the, the, this new interest in allowing child labor and allowing child labor in dangerous circumstances is very, very disturbing. Um, and, you know, it took a tremendous movement 
um, to put any restrictions on child labor. And part of the challenge was that they came from families that were so desperate um, to have income that, that if the parents couldn't make a sufficient wage, then they needed the kids to work outside the home to bring more money into the household. And, and so part of the problem is not just looking at the children, but also at you know, what are the parents able to earn um, so that they might be unfortunately willing um, to send their children out to work. So, and then the next one, Robin? The next one was, um, how is um, historians views on this process changed over time? I know that's a, that's a big question. <laughs> a big question. And I, and, I, and I don't know whether the person asking means strikes in general or this particular Just that strike. particular strike. This particular right. strike, yeah. I, I think that, um, so I wrote a piece um, for the 35th anniversary of the strike. I've actually, I wrote a piece on the 10th an anniversary and maybe the 25th, but I know that when it came to the 35th, which would have been 2020, um, rattling around in my head was the theme for uh, National History Day. And uh, at the Eastside Freedom Library, we work a lot with middle and high school kids who are doing History Day projects. And every year there is a new theme for History Day. And, uh, and that year, the theme for History Day was triumph and tragedy. And since at this stage of my life, as I've been saying tonight, I've gotten so interested in contradictions and how prevalent contradictions are, um, that I especially appreciated that the theme was not triumph or tragedy, the theme was triumph and tragedy. And that led me to frame the piece that I wrote about the 35th anniversary of the strike um, as how it was both a triumph and a tragedy. And, and I think in the years closer to the strike itself, I was a loudmouth about the triumph side. And, and how much the strikers had demonstrated about their capacity uh, to practice solidarity. Um, and, and now I'm more interested in the contradiction of how it is both a triumph and a, a tragedy. Um, you're welcome, any of you, to email me if you'd like me to send you the piece that I wrote. On the, on the 35th anniversary of the strike. And then um, you can write to me at peter at eastsidefreedomlibrary.org. Um, that should be pretty easy to remember. And I'll, I'll send you my piece on the 35th anniversary. Um, so um, Robin, you said Toru oh, had, had a had question? A, yeah. Um... And we want to thank Toru and his students for being here tonight from Japan. Um, we know that it's probably, I'm not sure what time it is in Japan, <laughs> but, um, but there are students here from Japan, and he commented on that and said, um, uh, what is the message that you would most like to let them understand? Wow. Well, I, I, I think it's, it's about contradictions, and it's to understand how much our lives are, are caught up in, in contradictions. And how can we think our way through them, not negate or erase one side of it? You know, like, oh, let's not talk about the tragedy. That's a bummer. Let's just talk about the triumph. No, let's, let's, let's deal with the whole mess. And, and, and figure out how can we insert ourselves in those contradictions in a way that we can push the whole energy 
in what we think is a positive and productive direction. Um, I think that I was having a conversation with an old friend yesterday and we were talking about the Ghanaian symbol of the Sankofa bird, um, the bird that flies forward while its neck and head is craned looking backwards. And that the only way that we can move forward is by understanding where we've come from. Um, not, not denying it, pretending it didn't happen, um, and, and not being totally limited by it. But um, we have to know where we've come from in order to be ready to go where we would like to go. Thank you, Peter. And um, thank you all for being here. Um, if people want to stay on for just a few minutes, um, I'll see if we can stop the recording and turn on your um, microphones. Um, we don't want to run too much longer and impose on Peter, but um, we would love to have a few comments um, once we get the recording off. But I want to make a little plug for June 22nd. We'll have a great um, History Revealed program. Um, about Nature's Crossroads, a new book that's um, out by George Virtus and Christopher Wells. It's talking about environmentalism. It's a, it's a historical and environmental study of the evolution of this Minneapolis-St. Paul area. And it's a wonderful book. It's got a lot of essays in it that I haven't quite finished yet, but all of the ones I've read have been great. So we're really looking forward to that. And again, that's June 22nd, again, at seven o'clock on Zoom. And so check out our websites for registration information. So again, thank you all for being here. And a big thank you to Peter Ratcliffe from the Eastside Freedom Library for this fascinating story of a very, as you mentioned, contradictory and complex history of one of many plants in the United States and the unions that you know formed it and formed our state. So again, thank you all for being here tonight.